danger that I may fall asleep. If I do, somebody just come up and grab the Bible from my hand before it hits the floor and finish the sermon for me. That would be great. <laughs> We're going to look at Luke chapter 5 this morning. Luke chapter 5 and starting at verse 33. So if you have a Bible you want to follow along in, now that's what we'll do that possibly. Yeah, there it is. It's way ahead of me as usual. So the, this morning, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about fasting. You know, we're in the time of Lent. And as good Baptists, we pay no attention whatsoever to Lent. But, but the, much of the Christian church is in a, in a time when they're marking Lent. And traditionally, that's marked with a fast. Now, the traditions surrounding Lent date back to the very earliest church. Um, they, they date back literally into the first century. People were preparing themselves for the celebration of Easter with a fast right back to the first century. So this has always been a part of Christian tradition. What hasn't always been a part of Christian tradition, what started there, was the idea that it was 40 days. And because of Jesus' fast of 40 days that's recorded, and 40 is a very significant number in the Bible, it's easy to understand how they settled on that. But that tradition kind of came along a few centuries later. At first, it was just a day or two. But, but it wasn't like what many people do these days for Lent, where they're like, oh yeah, I'm giving up chocolate, or I'm, I'm giving up coffee, which would be hard enough. When they fasted in the old days, they fasted. That means they maybe drank some water, but they ate nothing for one or two or sometimes three days. In preparation for Easter, they would eat nothing. At Easter, they'd have a feast. But before that, they would actually fast, fast, but eat nothing. And when the Bible talks about fasting, it's not talking about giving up so much. Oh, I'm not going to watch any Simpsons reruns. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go on Facebook. That's what some of my friends give up for life. I'm not going on Facebook for the whole period of Lent. So see you in 40 days. They post, and then you see nothing for them for 40 days. Um, that's not what they were doing. When it talk, in the Bible, when it talks about fasting, they're talking about not eating for a set period of time. That's always what they're talking about. Because for them, it had a technical meaning. It wasn't about giving something up for Lent, keeping some tradition. It was about not eating anything. And the reason that you do that, which, again, escapes many Baptists, the reason that you do that, that I found in the fast that I've done is twofold. Number one, it, it's meant to remind you of our reliance on God. It's meant to remind you that without God's grace, we're nothing. It, it's meant to remind you how feeble and, and uh, like dust we occur. I mean, you just, you go without food even for 14 hours, 16 hours. You start to really feel like a different person. You, you feel physically in pain. You start to feel weak. It doesn't actually affect what you could lift. If you went to the, to the gym and, and did a strength test, and then you fasted for 24 hours and you did another strength test, I'm pretty sure you could lift just as much. But you, you really do feel like, oh man, I can't even get up off the couch. I can't lift my own self, never mind anything else. You just feel weak and miserable. And it's meant to remind you that we are weak and miserable creatures. And that without the sustaining grace of God, we are nothing. The other thing that it did for me that I hadn't realized that was, I knew that that was the expectation and I did experience that. The other thing it did for me that I didn't expect is it gives you a lot more time to think about God. Because you don't realize how much time you spend thinking about food and preparing food and purchasing food, and consuming food, and cleaning up from the consumption of food, until at 6 p.m. you have to pour yourself a glass of water, and you have to sip it, and you have to put the cup down on the counter. This is not even really dirty, because all you have is water. It, you all of a sudden, you have a it's like, man, it didn't take very long to drink that glass of water. Now what I'm going to do for the other 48 minutes I usually spend cooking, and the other 32 minutes I usually spend eating. And the other 15 minutes I usually spend cleaning up the mess. I, I have nothing to do for the next hour and a half because all I did was sit the glass and I'm done. Really? I'm done? That was it? Okay. Uh, what am I going to do now? And you, at least for me, I found myself with a ton of time that I 
didn't even realize that I was spending doing something else that I had then to spend in the focus of God. So that's what fasting is about. Now let's look at what the scripture has to say. You kind of need that context though, because if, if you've never fasted, you have no idea what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus is talking to an audience that understood all of that. They had fasted. These were Jewish people. They fasted as part of their religion a couple of times a year, every year. They, they knew all of that. And Jesus is actually getting picked on because in his lifetime, he didn't fast enough. He fasted 40 days before he began his public ministry. But then he doesn't spend a lot of time fasting the rest of his ministry. We don't hear a lot of sermons about Jesus fasting after that. In fact, it seems like they didn't do it near enough. And they certainly weren't following the Jewish calendar of fasts, which was a different calendar depending on which group you belong to, which group of Jews, how serious you were. The hardcore Jews fasted a lot more than the others. But, but they all fasted, except Jesus and his followers didn't. And the the Pharisees were very confused by this. So they come to him and they said, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear. He will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. So the first thing should be pretty obvious to Chinese people. You don't go to a wedding banquet to fast, right? Uh, I don't know how many, if you've ever been to a Chinese wedding banquet. I've never been to a real, authentic, a full meal. Day. My wife and I had our wedding reception at a Chinese buffet, but I understand it might be slightly different. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, you don't go to a wedding banquet if you're fasting, if you're hoping to maintain a fast. I, I would think that being at a Chinese wedding and trying to fast would be the definition of sort of self-induced torture, right? That would be as bad as it gets. They're bringing dish after dish after dish to the table. Everybody else is enjoying all the best food that, that you can possibly have, and you're sitting there, no, 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 What's wrong with you? Why don't you eat anything? They would get frustrated. And that's the picture Jesus presents for them. When the bridegroom is there, and you're at the wedding feast, and everybody's celebrating that the wedding just happened, you don't know, fast. And Jesus said, for my disciples, we're in that season. This season that we're in is a party. It's a celebration. But the day will come when they will fast. You know, sometimes... Maybe this is even more familiar for some of you than, than Lent. If you spend much time looking at, you know, real Baptist websites, don't tell your parents. But <laughs> if you spend time on the internet looking at real Baptist websites, you're going to find some, eventually, that start saying things like, if it's not in the Bible, we're not going to do it. If it, Jesus and his disciples didn't practice Lent, we're not going to practice Lent. That's some kind of made-up nonsense that came later. Real, I was in Carolina recently, forgive the sudden appearance of draw. I still talking about that. <laughs> the, uh, the, the real disciples of Jesus just do what the disciples of Jesus did in the Bible. Well, there's a major problem there. I don't know if you saw it in the text. Did you? Jesus says that his disciples will do stuff they're not doing now. Well, that's a problem. <laughs> Jesus says they're not fasting now, but they're going to in the future. So the fact that the church continued to make up other traditions after Jesus left was the plan. That was the plan. So the problem with saying we're only going to do the 
stuff in the Bible is in the Bible it says that you're supposed to do stuff that's not in the Bible. You know, they never sang any of these songs we sang. This. They didn't know any of those songs. Not one. None of these date to the first century. We, we don't know any songs from the first century. We know the lyrics, we think, of one hymn from the first century, but we have no clue as to the tune. So we're completely lost. If we, if we wanted to only sing songs from the first century, we would have to just do a reading in unison, and I hate them, because they always sound terrible. There's always one person that's way out in front and loud, and there's always somebody dragging me behind, because there's no music to hold you together, and you're never, ever together. I despise my least favorite thing about the church is when we read in unison. I think it's beautiful that we have things to say in unison, and I like the things we say in unison, but I hate doing it. I just, that's me. I just hate doing it because it's never in unison. Oh, if it were unison, that'd be lovely. But that's the biggest euphemism in the church. Unison, we never achieve that. We're always about half a beat off. There's always one person saying the last three words of whatever we said after everybody else has stopped. It's kind of fun to laugh at, it, but it's not fun to experience. I don't like doing it. The, no, but we, we sing these songs, we, we take up offering, we offer prayers, we do all kinds of things. They didn't know anything about the first century, but that was the plan from the beginning. Jesus' plan from the beginning was that the Holy Spirit was supposed to come into his people, lead them in direction, and we were supposed to create new paths. We were supposed to find new paths. If we were only supposed to do exactly what the first century church did, no one, uh, most, 99% of this audience, I think probably 100% of this audience, would never be here. Because in the, in the Bible, they don't preach to the countries where my ancestors come from. They don't preach to the countries where your ancestors come. They don't get to any of that in the time that's recorded in the Bible. There are no Western European people in there. There are no Chinese people in there. Right? There are Jews. There's a few Greeks. There's a few Romans, maybe. There, there's none of us. I'm glad that they didn't stick to the plan. Just do what the stuff that's in the Bible wear a pair of sandals and a robe and walk around Jerusalem talking about the kingdom of God being in it. That's all you can do. And anything else you do is wrong. It's a sin. Nonsense. So if you stumble onto one of those websites or you hear one of those preachers, you can listen to it if you like, if it entertains you. But understand the idea that you can only do what's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, it's good. And if it's not in the Bible, it must be bad. That's nonsense. It, it sounds like a really good idea, because we love to, and I love to, honor the Bible and follow the scriptures. It's not why I'm up here preaching the Bible to you this morning. But the fact is, in the Bible, it tells you that you're allowed to go outside the bounds of just what's in the Bible. That doesn't mean you're allowed to go against what's in the Bible, but you're not bound to just doing the stuff that you hear. You hear anybody say that, you know, it might have one screw a little loose. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. Well, sometimes in fashion these days, we might do something as goofy as that. But they, you're talking about people that were actually struggling to pay the bills. They, an extra set of clothes was a really rare thing. And if you had an old and tattered coat, and you finally got the money together to buy one new coat, they didn't have 37 things. They didn't have 37 sweaters they never wear because that's so last season. They didn't have that kind of luxury. The world in which we live, they knew nothing about. You were considered wealthy in this, in this society if you had five changes of clothes. Whoa. I packed five changes of clothes to go to Carolina in my carry-on bag. And, <laughs> and you have to be really selective about which five, because there's lots of things to choose from. You check the weather forecast on They didn't know anything about that. They had five changes of clothes, and all five probably looked about the same. 
and that was the wealth. Poor people had one set of clothing, and they wore it all the time. 62 days in a row without taking a shower. Right? It was just a whole different world than, than the one in which we live. And they said, man, if you got a new coat, you don't tear a piece out of it to go pack the old one. Most of Jesus' audience would have been going, well, no. Of course not. I mean, we might do something as goofy as that because we really like the old jacket. And it looked kind of cool with this new pink patch right there on the elbow. That kind of looks cool. They didn't do that. There was no desire to do anything like that. What Jesus is describing is not a fashion thing. It's all about practicality. He says, don't take it. And they go, yeah, okay, of course, Jesus, we get it, we get it, yeah, we do that. What's he talking about? He's not talking about clothes. He's talking about taking this new thing. It's all right. What? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Oh. I didn't do anything. <laughs> It was me, I, I but sorry. <laughs> so anyway, that the uh, you don't take those those old you don't patch old garments with new clothes. And that what he's saying is you can't kind of fit this old Jewish system into this new religion, Christianity. You can't adopt the old system and try to kind of meld the two together. And well, thankfully we're done with that, right? No one would ever try to do anything like that. There's nothing, there's no branch of the church or any kind of Christian or anybody in Baptist churches who would ever think, oh yeah, we should take some old things and some new things and kind of weave them together and if we could just follow some of the Jewish rules, that'd be really cool. That'd be much better than, than ignoring them all together and just following a new set of standards. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. Right? We have people that do exactly that, that try to to patch on, they try to sew on, they try to get little bits of the old Jewish faith, which part should we keep, which part should we reject? Well, let's see, let's look through the Old Testament and find things we like. And every once in a while they, they come across some new thing. A few years ago, before some of you were even born, there was this huge craze about this guy in the Old Testament called Jabez. And everybody had prayer, prayed the prayer of Jabez. Thankfully, that went away as about as fast as it rose up. But everybody prayed the prayer of Jabez. When people would ask me to pray of Jabez, I'd say, you know what, I like this other prayer. It's called the prayer of Jesus. Why don't you pray that one? It's, the church has only been praying it for 2,000 years. It, when his disciples asked him, how should we pray? He didn't say, well, there's this bit character recorded in just a couple of verses way back in the Old Testament records. If you look that up, if you pray that prayer, that would be his disciples asked him, Jesus, how should we pray? And then he said, Our fault, our fault, how could we?